Okay, uh, hello everyone. Um, so I'm coming back to you with my first uh, video lecture in uh, quite some time. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to be able to go back to face-to-face -face classes mostly. Uh, so I haven't been doing so many video lectures. Um, but I wanted to talk today anyway uh, about a, a book that I read recently uh, on the uh, Budakumin in Japan. And this book just came out. Uh, it's brand new. Um, it, it caught my eye on uh, Twitter or something when another academic was uh, uh, posting about it. And I just happened to be planning and, and teaching a course this semester on the kind of socioeconomic uh, history of modern Japan. And I thought this uh, book would be a really good fit uh, for the course. So I, I read through it. And um, ultimately, um, I, I kind of wanted to plan this as, as part of a bigger uh, lecture incorporating um, you know, many uh, different pieces of scholarship on the uh, Budakumin um, and, and kind of talk about uh, the issue more comprehensively. Um, but I've, I've decided eventually to kind of separate these two things and instead today just focus in this talk on um, a recent book uh, that, that I read um, by Kurokawa Midori um, about this uh, issue. Um, so it'll be kind of a, a shorter talk, I think, um, and uh, I'm just going to focus exclusively uh, on some of the arguments and information presented in the book. Um, and I, uh, I hope that you'll be able to get something out of this and to kind of see where the book is coming from and also how it compares with some other scholarship that is already out there uh, about Budakumin history. Okay, um, so the book is called, I have just kind of translated it, given it a loose, very loose translation as historical attitudes toward the Budakumin Difference and Assimilation by Kurokawa Midori, published by Iwanami in 2021, this year. And uh, this is the book here you can uh, see. Okay, and I, sh I should mention that, you know, there's, there's other studies of uh, the Budakumin uh, already out there, and a couple in English uh, are in, um, well, one, of, well, one would be uh, Miki Sohane's uh, classic work, Peasants, Rebels, Women, and Outcasts, The Underside of Modern Japan. And he talks uh, in, in detail about uh, the Budakumin history, um, modern history here, and especially their, um, what, what's so great about uh, Hane's book is uh, that he really focuses on the individual uh, experiences of people, uh, looking at diaries, personal accounts, things like that, um, that really make a, a powerful impact on the reader. Um, so this one, you know, definitely highly recommend um, if you're just getting into the issue. Um, there's also an article on the Budakumin in uh, an edited volume by Michael uh, Weiner, J uh, Japan's Minorities, the Illusion of Homogeneity. Um, and the article in here is, is also quite good, uh, brings, the, brings the reader up to speed a little bit more, covering some more... Um, contemporary issues as well. So um, I think these works and this one especially really give a kind of a more um, comprehensive overview and, and a better introduction for the reader. In my class we read um, parts of both of these works as well. Um, 
so I would start here probably if you're just getting into the issue, but um, you know, if you are interested in, in kind of learning about where um, you know, modern Japanese scholarship is, or contemporary Japanese scho historical scholarship is going in relation to the issue, uh, then definitely check out this work by Kurokawa as well. Um, okay, so <clears throat> these aren't really chapter headings. I just kind of, I pulled some keywords out of the chapters, chapter headings basically, um, and just kind of maybe loosely use them here for my own headings. But um, in the in introduction, she kind of highlights some ongoing historical problems. Um, for instance, in 1919, only 3% of Budakumin married outside their own community. And in 1993, it was still only 36.6%. Uh, even into the 1990s, parents continued to oppose marriages to Budakumin. Budakumin people also felt pressure not to marry outside their communities. Anti-discrimination education seemed to have little effect on changing old prejudices. And Kurokawa, um, she kind of lays out her position, um, you know, up front, uh, which is basically, she says in the introduction, and Periodically throughout, you can tell this is the perspective she's coming from. She blames this on kind of loosely Japanese society rather than the ruling elite or ideology. Um, I think she kind of tries to be a little bit forgiving even of ruling elites sometimes, showing them as kind of trying to be compassionate or even helpful uh, to Budakumin and, and legitimately wanting to change like old ingrained stereotypes and kind of probably what she would think are, you know, backwards, like folk traditions or something like that. Um, I, I don't actually really agree with this. I think, um, you know, as Marx said, um, the ruling ideology of the day is always the ruling ideology, is always the ideology of the ruling class. Um, and this is my own perspective on this. So, uh, ruling class institutions and ideology shape uh, uh, how you know people's consciousness of of things would be my perspective. But she doesn't, I don't think, share that view. Um, okay, so uh, Kurokawa then focuses on two categories: dissimulation and assimilation. Um, Assimilation, I mean, this has been a, a you know, doka, right? This is a common a theme that comes up in other research as well, especially Japanese research, Ogama Eiji, for instance, looking at, um, you know, the roles of um, uh, Okinawa and, and Korea and Hokkaido, for instance, uh, in the shaping of modern Japan and looking at kind of doka efforts there, um, or kominka efforts to make people Japanese. Dissimilation, I have not seen so much on. Uh, it's kind of an awkward word in English and I think Japanese too, but Kurokawa is focused on this, how Budokamin attempt to um, stress their own unique kind of uh, heritage and um, identities. Um, so as I say here, right? Uh, and so the first would be when Budokumin take pride in their own history identity. The second would be a strategy of downplaying difference. Both were used by Budokumin and non-Budokumin in various ways through history. So regardless of kind of um, a little bit of difference of views between myself and the author regarding um, perspective, um, Kurokawa's book, as we will see, is I still think a really great book and uh, full of useful very useful information. Um, and she really does uh, do a good job of tracing uh, this modern history and uh, shaping at it and uh, shifting attitudes um, within the Budakumin community and toward the Budakumin community. Um, so she starts with the Meiji period of liberation and oppression, um, or as characterizing it as a time, I should say, of liberation and oppression. Um, Starting with it, the Meiji, from the Meiji Restoration, the 1868 idea of ikun banmin, um, which would mean, you know, basically 
um, everybody united under one sovereign, right? Under one emperor, okay? So this idea of making a citizenry, making a, uh, or subjects, modern subjects, making a population kind of, um, and this replaces obviously the old Toki Tokugawa uh, class uh, system in a way, at least in name. Um, in 1870, average people were allowed last names. Uh, in 1871, the what was later called, um, or came to be known as the Kaihode, uh, eliminated class distinctions, including those that separated the Budakumin or Eta and Hinin from other, uh, from everyone else. Um, and everyone was supposed to have become Shinmin or subjects of the emperor. Um, well, the government, you know, practically wanted to conduct an accurate census. It also wanted to collect taxes from all its subjects, and previously Budakumin lands had not been taxed. Um, so this was, in a way, just a legal framework, and it didn't equate to immediate, um, to attitudes changing, you know, overnight. And in fact, um, you know, one thing I was really interested in, and, and a student asked me this, um, in a different class uh, earlier when we were talking about the introduction of uh, an onset of capitalism in modern Japan. And, you know, I'm, I mentioned that uh, most average people didn't benefit from uh, the introduction of capitalism and things actually got worse for them. And as the student said, well, what about the Budakami? What about Eto or Hinin? Didn't things get better for them? And that's actually kind of I wanted to answer that question. That's that's one of the reasons why I picked up this book. Um, and to be honest, it, it I, I didn't really find exactly um, the answers to that because it's not really what Kudokawa focuses on. Um, but there were a lot of you know pieces of evidence that certainly would point to that. Um, and so, for instance, Eta and Hinin were in fact deprived of many of the jobs that they had done that had sustained them even though there was a stigma that surrounded those jobs um, they were deprived of the right to dispose dead cattle or horses for leather and there and you know these were often replaced with modern tanning techniques right making leather in modern factories that now budokami can't compete with uh, those factories for example um, they they lose the exclusive right to um, to do those jobs, even though they had some stigma that surrounded them. Um, but in many cases, then that just results in them being you know worse off, unemployed, um, and now having to deal with a money economy and wage labor, and not being able to um, earn any money. Um, in some places, for Budakumin to receive the title of Heimin, uh, which was another term used at the time, just kind of average people or commoners, uh, they were forced to conduct purification rituals. So again, it shows that these discrimination obviously just didn't disappear overnight. It remained quite strong. The idea of uh, kegare, of uncleanliness, um, surrounding the Budakumin date, it dates to the 14th century uh, and there was the Tokugawa idea as well that slaughtering animals or executions were unclean and the Bakufu de designated these jobs to senmin. So this was a term that was used in that period, but always to refer to um, the groups that we're talking about, Budakumin, Eta, or Hinin. Um, the Meiji government also wanted to appease Western ideas of equality, but popular opinion opposed giving Budakumin rights. So the government was forced to backtrack on some of its policies. Um, and, you know, Hane also talks about this a lot, this kind of backlash against Budakumin um, by average people. And I'm really curious about this, you know, like why did this happen? And this was part of the kind of also what I was seeking to answer, and, and unfortunately there's, I didn't really find an answer to this in Kurokawa's book, um, but if you read Hane's book in the, the example of 
Budokumin testimonies in context with the other examples of people from that time, I think the answer becomes much clearer. And the reason, I would say, is because um, everybody at this time was in such destitute poverty. Um, and that, you know, Japan is a pretty resource scarce uh, country and life is not, and it historically has not been very easy for people. Um, and so there's a lot of um, competition and suspicion of neighbors, uh, especially when you're living a precarious existence and just scraping by basically day to day, um, there is a tendency to um, to kick down, basically, uh, to be uh, um, wary of others who, you know, you think you might be trying to kind of overtake you, right? So, so the, I think a lot of people in Japan, average peasants, um, you know, didn't like to see extra competition, or they saw Budokumin as, as now new competition, basically. Um, th th this would be my explanation, but Kurokawa never states this, I think, and it's kind of unfortunate. Um, <clears throat> But anyway, Budokumin themselves reacted very positively to being liberated from the case system. Um, and this is important, and this is part of the um, dissimulation, uh, I think, argument later. Um, but the Budokumin faced very harsh conditions from Meiji, um, such as pur purification rituals, having to renounce former jobs, very strict rules regulating dress and behavior, um, Nevertheless, many Budokumin tried to accept these and they donated money and welcomed the introduction of schooling. But again, there's this tension. Average people, though still discriminated and opposed against the Budokumin, and even now more forcefully, um, probably from Meiji, discriminated against them because they feel more threatened that these distinctions, these old distinctions, are being eliminated. So um, villagers would prohibit. Uh, Budokumin from entering the village or from sharing schools. They would refuse to hire Budokumin and they would, they were, it clearly indicated on Koseki, um, you know, who was from Budokumin areas. So this also enabled more further discrimination. Um, and again, she says this is her view that this is because of one, superstitions of becoming unclean and two, their own precarious position. So so she does acknowledge this, uh, I guess, and this fear of being overtaken from below. Um, okay, so this leads to Budokumin villages being attacked at least 21 times after the Kaiho Day was put into effect. Uh, the biggest attack was in Okayama Prefecture where 263 homes were burned down, 18 people were killed, and 38 people were injured. Um, and I think Hane and, and other scholars, you know, have focused on this as well. Um, Tokyo newspapers criticized these attacks as an obstacle to Japan's modernization, westernization, to its civilization efforts, to its kaika efforts. But the government largely listened to the rioters, and the kaihode even was effectively retracted in some places. Uh, at the same time, modern notions of race and science mixed with old myths of uh, the origins regarding the, quote, Japanese um, and the Budokumin. So now people basically from the modern era are trying to, there's this new category of, of Japanese, right? Like we're all Japanese subjects now, but now there's increased efforts to try to define like, well, what is Japanese? Who, who is Japanese and all of this, right? And this is all seen as very scientific because nationalism at this time in Japan is like a new and modern kind of idea, right? And it's supposed to be, um, it's supposed to kind of mirror like these trends in science to prove national nationality within DNA, basically. Um, and anthropologists even explained the Budokumin as different, as being a different race. So for example, like descended from Emishi, which was, uh, which it was, I guess, a group uh, in Japan, all over Japan, throughout Honshu, um, probably the dominant group uh, in Japan, I guess, um, for, for much of uh, early history, um, or being children of 
uh, Shu Fu, who was, uh, I, this kind of escapes me now, a uh, uh, famous Chinese uh, explorer, alchemist. I can't, I can't remember, actually, uh, to be honest. I, you have to look that one up on Wikipedia. Um, and so within this context, there is increasing opposition from, or, and discrimination against the Buddha Akhamin from the 1880s. Uh, so, you know, within a decade after, basically, the Kai Ho Day is introduced. And as things become more institutionalized in Japan, I think discrimination itself becomes more institutionalized, okay? Um, Buddha Akhamin are excluded from schools, for instance. Intermarriage is prohibited. In Kyoto, the city didn't uh, issue land ownership certificates to Buddha Akhamin landowners. Um, so this idea of equality, um, which Kurokawa says and argues quite convincingly was just tatemai, just pretense from the beginning, was completely dropped at this time. Um, at the same time, many Budokumin began to push back against this and to exercise their newfound rights. Um, and early on, this was done by uh, joining with the Freedom and People's Rights Movement, the Jiumin Kanundo. Um, there were big participants in this to kind of further democratize uh, Japan. Um, this was a unfortunately kind of failed movement and it eventually became uh, just a bourgeois movement or absorbed into kind of bourgeois politics. Uh, but early on it did have a lot of uh, radicals uh, in it who were, were you know actually pushing to uh, pushing Japan in a more radical democratic uh, direction. Um, also, the first Budokumin groups formed, such as the Fuken Dome. Um, okay, and then these trends kind of continue through the 1880s, 1890s. Um, newspapers printed discriminatory articles. Um, and against the background of increasing poverty um, following and partly as a result of the economic shocks caused by the Matsutaka deflation, um, people began to fear the Budokumin even more as, quote, dangerous criminals. Um, and meanwhile, the Budokumin are starving, and they appeal to the government for relief. Um, and disease as well, such as cholera, ravages the Budokumin communities. So Matsutaka deflation, poverty at this time hit everyone very hard, but the Budokumin especially hard. And sadly and ironically that leads the rest much of japanese society though to kind of um you know uh fear them basically um because they're you know so being so pushed to the wall right um budokumin elites launch launched then a budokumin improvement movement budaku kaizen undo and this was an attempt to rectify the negative images in society against the Budokumin. But it should be noted that, so I'll indicate this throughout, and Kudokawa does this as well, that, you know, which is kind of an elite-led movement and which is um, more grassroots movement. And the Budokumin improvement movement was more um, kind of top-down elites, um, it was, and it was based on the premise that Budokumin were indeed unclean and needed improvement. And this is the main point of this, that it accepts, it doesn't challenge society's uh, perceptions, perceptions and mistaken perceptions of the Budokumin. Rather, it accepts that as its premise for improving um, or changing the Budokumin community. And there's class differences within the Budokumin as well. Um, former leather industry owners, for instance, turn often into parasitic landlords, while the rest of the Budokumin were unemployed and reduced to begging. Um, and again, th I mentioned this is because of loss of traditional, many traditional jobs relating to leather when factory owners switched to modern Western methods of leather making. Um, the elite improvement movement tried to introduce new jobs to the Budokumin community, such as paper and umbrella making. They promoted also cleanliness schemes in the community. Um, and these policies were based on ideas of assimilation. 
Um, and appeals to nationalism were also a, a big part of this. Um, actually, and this is kind of, this is important, it comes up later, and this relates not just to elite-led movements, but also to grassroots movements as well, um, that groups would argue, Budokamin liberation groups would argue that they were all the same imperial Japanese subjects. So appealing, you know, to not just ideas of nation, but also race as well. And within this, Budokamin were encouraged to migrate abroad to Japanese colonies in Hokkaido, uh, colonies as well as Hokkaido and Okinawa. Um, this comes up more later too. Um, there is an, uh, also a problem, and this isn't identified in, in at the time, I don't think, but um, Kurokawa notes the problems of the family system as well. So the family system, this um, Yeseido, which also becomes institutionalized from this time um, in the civil law, for instance, Meiji civil law, which puts positions the male, um, the father as the head of the household who makes all of this, the decisions for everyone. And lineage is passed on through, um, you know, the firstborn uh, son, male offspring. And people have last names now. So this idea of, you know, this lineage passing on and carrying the family and being the head of the family becomes very important. And um, it, but what this does is has the effect of not only creating huge um, gender divisions uh, within society and the family, and, but and power divisions, but also um, it reinforces kind of discrimination against Budokumin because now where there before it used to be more flexible that people could you know perhaps fall in and out of these different categories uh, or be after engaging in a job that was considered unclean you know maybe become even kind of a so-called Budokumin, but. Now these things become stationary and fixed with marriage, essentially, and, and birth uh, and lineage and all of this thing. So it becomes harder for, even though that people, where, where people are trying to move up through the social ladder, it also becomes much more rigid and strict. Um, and an example of this is in 1900, when a woman successfully sued for divorce after finding out her husband was Budokumin, and the court said that Budokumin were a different race and that the man committed fraud. Um, but, you know, within the government, you know, courts and, and different parts of the government and committees are taking really different um, and often contradictory uh, um, positions toward the issue because the government also joined with the improvement movement to tackle the Budokumin, quote, problem in the early 1900s. Uh, as I mentioned, these were elite top-down movements, and they compiled reports on the Budokumin situation, but like this court above, continued to portray the Budokumin as a different race. They also criticized the Budokumin for doing different or unclean jobs, and even said that they had different language and poor morals. So the improvement movement was really all about social uh, about control and socialization. The Budokumin were monitored and their behavior was regulated. And the government, again, had aims of wanting to prevent crime and disease um, and also to improve the situation of the Budokumin. Um, this is kind of like, I don't know, um, what would you say? Like, uh, it's kind of like loaning somebody money so that uh, they can start. Um, so that, that they can start an industry to produce something that is beneficial for you, right? Um, that it, it kind of helps them, but it actually helps you more. Um, and this is kind of why I think, you know, if you had to sum up, like why many people in the government wanted to help the Budokumin, because they didn't need them to be like productive tax paying members of society to a certain extent, but they weren't really interested in getting rid of discrimination, okay? Um, 
Another important uh, kind of factoid is that meat consumption increased after the Russo-Japanese War and the, the Meiji government passed the Slaughterhouse Law, which attempted to regulate and modernize industry with positive and negative effects for Budokumin. But um, a large part of why Budokumin were discriminated against in the first place is that meat consumption itself was considered unclean. And that Japanese people, you know, throughout the pre-war period, um, you know, didn't, had an aversion to eating meat, basically. And that um, people who ate meat and dealt with meat and dealt with animals and killing of animals um, would, were considered basically unclean and would, could get potentially this label of Budokka meat. But, but this kind of begins to change, okay? So this, this is also in the background as well. Um, in the interwar period, um, there emerges kind of a nationalist um, Budokumin movement. Uh, okay, so after the 1910 high treason incident uh, in which some Budokumin were implicated, the government began to fear uh, the radicalization, and then this, this just means like, you know, socialism or communism, right, of uh, the Budokumin. Um, they, they started to fear that um, because the Budokumin were so poor and bearing all the negative consequences of capitalism, that they would uh, inevitably be more inclined toward uh, socialism or communism. Okay, makes sense. Um, now, this is irrespective of their connection to the high treason incident, which is um, much of which was kind of, um, you know, trumped up and fabricated by the government in the first place. I, I don't have time to get into that at the moment. Um, meanwhile, um, the, uh, the Yamato Doshikai formed in Nara, uh, a Budakumin, again, another liberation uh, group. Um, and this is more grassroots, a little bit more grassroots. It's kind of, uh, it encompasses, it's more of an autonomous Budakumin movement. And their aim is assimilation. They appeal themselves as equal imperial subjects, Shinmin. Uh, the head Matsui Atsugoro uh, emphasized also their patriotic credentials. They were staunchly anti-socialist. Um, and they demanded equal access to education and an end to discrimination. Um, they attacked the idea that Budakumin were a different uh, race, and they said they were all the same Yamato race. So interestingly, um, I live in Nara, by the way, and um, Yamato, the, the prefix or the word Yamato is, is everywhere. Um, and I, I think it's really interesting to point out the connection to this history and perhaps part of the reason for maybe even why um, the name became used so frequently. And I th it, it connects to um, this history, I would say, that um, of... of people wanting to emphasize themselves as the same kind of national race. Um, and it's part of this kind of um, an assimilation and attempt to end historical discrimination. Um, their magazine highlighted uh, Budakumin success stories, and it borrowed from ideas of um, Rishin Shusei, like moving up in the world and self-improvement. So, um, yeah. And they don't criticize, though, the foundations of the state or the system that persecute them, but rather affirm uh, these foundation, uh, these foundations. Uh, uh, the sentence kind of trails off there, but whatever. Um, and similar doshikai sprung up around the country. One in Hiroshima even repeated authorities' claims uh, or, or calls to pay taxes to be and to be good subjects. Some local magazines uh, by doshikai uh, or Doshikai magazines, even featured articles by police calling to improve morals. So, you know, very much kind of repeating the authorities' lines and dominant um, ruling class ideology here within the autonomous Budokumin liberation group um, and appealing to nationalism and ideas of race. Uh, in 1914, the Imperial Path of Justice Association uh, Teikoku Kodokai, this is not my translation, I'm borrowing this from Tsutsui uh, work that he published recently, 
um, formed as a parent organization for the various doshikai, with it, an influential person being Oe Taku. Uh, and there are uh, existing studies, many studies in Japanese and English of, of him as well. Oe Taku is a very influential person in the Budokami movement. Um, they said that full integration and assimilation of the Budokamin were necessary to strengthen the emperor, empire, and um, the Kodokai uh, was, could also be classified as now more of an elite movement that sees the Budokamin as a different uh, race. So um, in this sense, it's still kind of elite top-down carrying on um, you know, kind of earlier, from earlier improvement movements. Um, the movement also reaffirmed um, Japanese racism. The Budokumin sought to, uh, within the group, sought to deny uh, Koreans and Chinese, uh, their Korean or Chinese origins and claimed that they were fully, quote, Japanese. And the Kodokai sought to emigrate some of its members to Hokkaido and Manchuria uh, but those that did go ended up facing um, many hardships, receiving poor and inhospitable land. So that did not work out too well. But it was a strategy that was and continued to be promoted throughout the, um, even in, throughout the, the war. Um, rice prices, uh, in the background of this historical background then, um, and moving on into the late 1910s, rice prices skyrocketed after World War I. Um, and this was a big blow to the Budokumin community, who A, had uh, no to little money, and B, owned little to no land to farm, so had very low self-sustainability. Um, and it also, much of the community also lost its customers for traditional industries, leather meat, um, shoemaking, uh, as well, because people have less disposable income to, to spend at this time. And therefore, many Budokumin participated in the rice riots of 1918. Um, but the government, um, which you know, cracked down on rioters quite violently, um, used this in a, as an excuse to uh, portray all Budokumin as criminal, criminal um, rioters. Uh, much of this, of course, was exaggerated. Um, Budokumin were blamed for leading the riots, though even though it was, um, you know, took place throughout all levels of society, uh, lower levels of society. And um, ironically, uh, elite Budokumin groups like the Kodokai even joined with the authorities in blaming the rest of the Budokumin community. Um, and people again, at, and during these times of economic precarity and crisis, um, inherent in capitalism, uh, average people, uh, discrimination worsens uh, in this case. And average people begin to fear, again, violent backlash from the Budokumin. Ironically, this is an implicit acknowledgement of centuries of discrimination. Um, but the government tries to assuage, assuage uh, these kind of uh, uh, people's fears um, by adopting a policy of dojo, just sympathy. <clears throat> urging pe average people to sympathize with the Budokumin while urging the Budokumin themselves to reform. Um, okay, and outside, though, the government is, you know, also concerned about ending discrimination because um, they're concerned about their public image, basically, uh, in, you know, in the world. Uh, they're uh, you know, it's as a matter of foreign diplomacy, right? Because um, as, as you know, um, the Japanese delegation to the, um, uh, to the Paris Conference and the signing of the Versailles uh, Treaty pushed for an anti-racism clause, um, at, which was unfortunately unsuccessful, but um, they, they were pushing for an anti-racism clause uh, within the treaty uh, abroad. Um, seeking to end discrimination against Japanese and other Asians. But there's also discrimination then, you know, um, within Japan. And they didn't, that was kind of an embarrassing issue, right? So they didn't want to seem hypocritical as a matter of foreign diplomacy. Um, 
Meanwhile, uh, liberal elite Budokan movements, such as the Improvement Movement, um, uh, changed their name to Yua Jigyo Kyokai. Yua Jigyo Kyokai. Here after uh, just YJK. Um, and aristocrats like Arima Yoriyasu also formed charity and philanthropy organizations for the Budokan Min. Arima himself wanted to save the lower classes from socialism and promote harmony between rulers and the people. He wanted to protect the position of the elites in society from rebellion. Elites wanted to use the family system to eliminate discrimination, but um, as Kurokawa points out, uh, it was the very family system itself that was one of the causes of discrimination. So there's this inherent contradiction within elite ruling class ideology, of course, as there often is. Um, they, their very own ideology is the source of um, average people's suffering. So I think, you know, I think kind of Kurokawa also has to implicitly acknowledge this within the book, even though at the beginning and end she argues that, um, you know, she doesn't stress ruling class ideology so much, but I don't know, for me it's it's quite apparent. Um, the 19, in the 1920s, the Budokami movement began to emphasize being proud of their identity heritage, and they emphasized again themselves as all being part of the same Yamato race, but uh, unfortunately do not extend this anti-racism to Chinese or Koreans. Um, but there is, there does, against the background of Wilsonian self-determination, there does emerge kind of a belief that Chinese and, or that China and Korea must lead their own movements, uh, their own independence or, or liberation movements against Japanese colonialism at this time, right? Okay, and then there emerges uh, the most important Budokamin uh, group, which is Sui Heisha. Uh, and this is uh, the most radical, grassroots, uh, autonomous uh, Budokamin group, uh, and the most important, I would say, Budokamin group uh, in, his in modern history. Um, in English, this would be tra translated as the Leveler Society, and which you might recognize from uh, English history, and it was directly taken from there uh, as well. Um, so there's this connection with uh, the English working class uh, as well, and this acknowledgement of history and of, of pushing for, um, you know, an end to class divisions and, uh, and increasing uh, democratic participants. Uh, this Sui Heisha formed in Nara in 1922. It was left wing, favorable to socialism, and members said they should be proud of their Budokamin identity. They wanted society to accept them as they were without having to conform to rigid rules, i.e. such as denying their background. So this is an explicit rejection of the improvement movement. Um, and there's much involvement or more involvement from the lower classes in Sui Heisha. Um, moreover, Sui Heisha denied the idea of a Yamato race and allied themselves with other oppressed and colonized groups, including Chinese and Koreans. So this is a huge uh, difference. Uh, the socialist Sano Manab Manabu uh, assisted Sui Heisha and influenced their ideas regarding ethnicity and race. Um, he saw and he and, and Sui Heisha began to see race as an elite attempt to divide the working class. So. Um, and they argued that the Budokamin must fight against this idea while also recognizing um, its uh, effects, which is to divide the working class, right? Um, but there was a split eventually between left and right factions of Sui Heisha in 1927. The right emphasized the idea of a shared Yamato race and wanted to make a strong Japanese empire. Um, Needless to say, popular society and elites feared Sui Heisha and elites resented their strong autonomy. Uh, Left-wing Sui Heisha members like Takahashi Saraki advocated a joint front with other workers. They recognized that racism and discrimination wouldn't end unless they rectified its root cause, which is capitalism. Uh, they also recognized that discrimination stems from economic factors uh, and, and poverty. They also formed connections with the Japanese Communist Party and the Ronoha. 
Meanwhile, elite Kodokai groups joined into one under the home ministry, so furthering their connections to the uh, government. They and other elites like Arima thought that um, ending Budakamin discrimination was just a problem of changing consciousness uh, and not fixing class problems. Um, some within the um, Yuajigyo Kyokai, however, do recognize that economic factors also play a part in discrimination. And the, the YJ case opposed discrimination from the perspective of the family state and because they thought it weakened the Japanese empire. So fundamental differences, again, between these groups, the elite top-down Kodokai, Yuajigyo Kyokai, and on the one hand, and Sui Heisha on the other. The Great Depression um, hit the Budakamin community very hard, and there was a huge disparity between average people and the Budakamin. The Depression also hit um, Korea very hard, and it was uh, and other marginalized and oppressed colonized groups, um, women and day, and so um, many women and day laborers. Um, from the colonies came to Japan looking for work, and especially to Budaku in Osaka, where they competed with Budakumin for low-paying jobs. Um, and you can see here pay differentials um, data from Kanagawa and Mie prefectures included in Kurokawa's book, which I've just copied and translated here. Um, first, the income wage gap or income differential between uh, men and women um, listed vertically here, and then horizontally we have non-Budakumin, Budakumin, and the percent difference. Um, so non-Budakumin men um, making uh, an average of you know one uh, 1.42 yen, um, whereas Budakumin would uh, be making um, an average of uh, only 0.66 yen, so 46.5% 40, difference. Uh, women would make less, um, just uh, 0.75 yen. Um, and I should have meant, put this somewhere, but I, I think this might be monthly wages, by the way, um, monthly income. Um, Budakumin would make only 0.47 yen, so even a very large difference there. Only make They're making 62.6% of what uh, non budakumin women make, um, and unemployment rates are much higher as well uh, in, during the Great Depression. So 22.3% uh, un unemployment rate, which again, I mean, is huge, but um, for non budakumin but for budakumin it's over half. It's 52.8%, and it was even lower um, amongst uh, Koreans. So they were, you know, you can kind of see the, uh, the kind of struggles, I guess, economic struggles that they're going through. Um, repression and turn to nationalism. So um, as I mentioned, more Koreans were coming to Japan to look for work. Um, they were, uh, Zainichi Koreans worked for less and were less organized to push back against capital like Sui Heisha Budakumin were. So, Capitalists favored uh, employing them, and this led some Burakumin to discriminate against Koreans, including not allowing them to public baths. So this is a, an example, I would say, of how um, ruling class ideology and modes of production, uh, capitalism, uh, directly, you know, by um, oppressing different groups in different ways, directly lead to discrimination. It's an economic, completely materialist origins. Um, but anyway, yeah. Um, meanwhile, Sui Heisha continued to favor a joint worker front. Um, so they're not giving up this position, still trying to unite with other uh, oppressed groups. Uh, Sui Heisha in 1933 sent a letter to the German embassy protesting the Nazi persecution of the Jews. Um, but in the within the 30s as well, liberals like the U.S. Jigyo Kyokai continue to see racism as a distinct problem, as a, as being distinct from the class struggle. They want to solve the race problem, uh, and they emphasize the same Yamato race uh, to make uh, Japan a strong empire. 
Um, however, others criticized this liberal position and blamed discrimination on liberalism and individualism, saying it goes against Nihon Seishin, which always emphasized harmony. So especially in the 1930s, there is more, even more right-wing critiques of, liberal, of liberals. Um, so, um, you know, um, this, this, we see this in politics at the time as well. Um, where, where this becomes stronger, there's more attacks against individualism, against liberalism. Um, and again, I mean, the liberal position, I would also say, was mistaken as well. That was part of the problem as well. But these both kind of groups, um, they are becoming very muddled in their um, understanding of the, the origins of, uh, of many of, of the problems, I guess, that they're facing. Um, and in the 1930s, under police pressure and repression and violence, Sui Heisha members begin to uh, do tenko, which means to uh, kind of uh, recant uh, and to abandon their Marxist positions uh, and to join with state socialists or fascists. Uh, and this uh, kind of repression um, and tenko would eventually lead to um, uh, basically the dissolution of Sui Heisha during uh, later years uh, in 1942. Um, and, but they were united under, they became united under the emperor ideology. Uh, in 1937 and 38, Sui Heisha began to cooperate with uh, Japan's war efforts and became mostly a national socialist organization or hold national socialist positions. Their weak point was that they never criticized the emperor system. They also abandoned the class struggle and focused only on ending discrimination. Um, one strategy for this was to support or to support the state was to immigrate to Manchuria, and this was supported by eventually all the major Budokumin groups and the government. Uh, immigration, uh, immigrating the Budokumin to Manchuria began in 1940. And many Budakumin were convinced of the propaganda of the quote harmony of the five races. They, th many people, many Budakumin thought that they were all part of the same Asian race. So buying into ideas of the greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere here, led by Japan. Um, I mean, it's easy to see. I think you know, if you faced all of the the struggles and hardships um, as a Budakumin person at this time that you had that, you know, going abroad might be a way to escape this um, discrimination and to, to really become fully, quote, Japanese and, and to um, become a member of the Japanese empire, like doing a, doing a great service for the empire, right? I mean, I, I think it's easy for me at least to imagine how, um, how people, how Budokumin people could, you know, be very easily persuaded by this. And the reality, of course, was much different for settlers and immigrants who did go to Manchuria and their hardships did not end. Um, but unfortunately, none of that was realized, I guess, until after uh, the war was over. Um, and the government continued to be worried about discrimination against Budakumin, um, but again, always from the perspective of because it internally makes the Japanese empire weak. Uh, and, and during the war years, it, it would weaken, for example, um, the Japanese military, for instance, right? Because they need more soldiers. They need a strong army. If there's infighting within the army, um, this is not a convenient thing for the government, right? So in 1940, the Ministry of Education issued a proclamation denouncing discrimination in the military and said it damaged the war effort. Instead, it emphasized ideas such as wa and nihon minzoku. In 1942, Sui Heisha dissolved and its members were absorbed into other nationalist groups. Okay, and then um, the book then ends, the last chapters are focusing on post-war dem democratization. Uh, after the war, Matsuda Kiichi and others for, um, other former Sui Heisha members formed the Budaku Kaiho Zenkoku Iinkai, Budaku Liberation National Committee, in 1955 renamed the Budakumin Liberation League. Um, Matsumoto Jiichiro, uh, who is an important uh, figure within Sui Heisha and also a diet uh, politician, 
uh, radical socialist diet politician, and others also criticize the emperor system as the source of their subjugation through the transfer of oppression and feelings of superiority um, by those closer to the emperor. But some also advocated just for reforming the emperor and not abolishing uh, the emperor system. As I mentioned, Matsumoto was a diet politician who publicly criticized and called to abolish the emperor system. Um, Budokumin groups also called for a democratic revolution to abolish remnants of feudalism. This is a big abolishing remnants of feudalism and the idea that Japan had not yet had a successful bourgeois revolution was a popular debate point amongst leftists and liberals um, in the, in the post-war, uh, but I don't have time to get into that now. But discrimination, unfortunately, did not go away. And the media still printed racist or discriminatory articles against the Budokumin. In 1951, a Kyoto official, a city official, published a racist story about the Budokumin. It was actually about Zainichi Koreans, but um, kind of both groups were portrayed quite poorly in the book. Um, in 1952, Wakayama official, and a Wakayama official made discriminatory, discriminatory comments. And Sui Heisha blamed um, these things and the, the inability to get rid of discrimination as a failure to properly democratize. Um, and they said that, that both of these things were, they blamed them on the fact that Japan was still occupied at this time by the US. But this critique was never really fleshed out and it kind of reflected the USSR stance toward the occupation. Um, there were also new groups that emerged, um, 1955, um, Budaku Kai Hodome, Budaku Mondai Kenkyu Jo, uh, published a magazine, Budaku Mondai. Um, 1957, a Budaku Min woman who was picking up spent bullets to sell for scrap on a U.S. military base was shot and killed. This led to an increased or uh, renewed focus on um, problems of the Budaku Min community. In the 1960s, Budaku Min critique began to link discrimination to capitalism. Uh, so again, this this critique, which once existed within Sui Heisha in the 1920s, was picked up again finally in the 1960s. Um, life was harder for the Budokumin under capitalism, and the Budokumin and Budokumin suicides, for example, were only a modern phenomenon, they note. And um, it seemed to be that only Budokumin livelihoods were not improving under Japan's high growth, high economic growth period. And even into the 1960s and 70s, most average people continue to see the Budokumin as a different race. Um, and in the 1970s, intellectuals like Noma Hiroshi, Yasuoka Shotaro, Inoue Hisashi, um, all writers, uh, actually take, took up the Budokumin problem, as well as anthropologists and sociologists who held pluralistic views of the nation state and recognized both Budokumin sameness and difference. And this is basically where Kurokawa ends the main chapters of the book. And then she has some epilogues or uh, whatnot at the end, um, which I uh, honestly uh, skipped over. Um, but I, I, I think this is kind of, um, this ends here the way that the main part of the book ends, uh, seems to emphasize what she's been trying, what Kurokawa has been trying to emphasize throughout the book, is this kind of shifting ideas um, within and toward the Budokumin community of sameness and difference, of assimilation and dissimilation. And this is how she kind of characterized the, the issue. Um, I don't know, maybe she gets into this more in the epilogue. I don't know. I found the ending to be a little bit sudden and it kind of ends like in the 1970s. Um, so to get a kind of better picture of where Budokumin issues are today, um, you might have to go back to Michael uh, Weiner's book, uh, for instance. Um, I don't have a concluding slide actually, so I'll just pull my face back up. But um, yeah, I mean, I again, I think I've already explained kind of my thoughts on Kurokawa's book. It, it was very enlightening, uh, full of very useful information. Uh, I learned a great deal from it. Um, I had a little bit different view of perspective, I guess her sta her standpoint for analysis. Um, in that she, I felt, kind of lets ruling class ideology and modes of production off the hook. Um, I would, that's what I would have taken as my basis for 
critique and the origin of discrimination, but um, I guess that's just a, a difference of analysis. Um, but it did not detract really um, from, um, from me enjoying uh, and, and again, getting a lot out of uh, the, the book. So if you want to learn, um, you know, quite in detail about Budokumin issues and history in, in modern Japan, um, yeah, I mean, I would definitely recommend this book, probably in tandem with the earlier studies in English that I mentioned um, and some more introductory studies uh, as well. And I guess if I had to say one more thing about Kurokawa's book, um, it's, it's very like kind of focused on ideas and institutions, and she doesn't really focus on individual Budakumin testimonies and voices. Um, and probably, I guess, you know, she m maybe mentions this in the book somewhere, you know, maybe that's a, um, a topic for a different study. I don't know, it's, it's just not the focus that she's taking. Um, um, but I don't know, I mean, those kind of individual testimonies, personal accounts, those things always make the strongest impression on me as a historian. And in that sense, if you wanted to um, really get a sense of that, um, I would recommend Hane's book, Peasants, Rebels, and Outcasts, uh, instead. Um, or also another book that I read recently um, uh, called A, uh, what was it? A River with No Bridge. Uh, which is a translation of a famous uh, by a famous uh, uh, writer, Japanese uh, woman writer, uh, Sumi Suie, I think, um, who uh, uh, describes in detail the lives of average Budokumin. So um, I would also definitely uh, get a hold of some studies like that as as well. But okay, thank you very much for listening.